tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We heard some kids screaming before we opened the door, but like there's no fire alarms going off or nothing. Deadly and suspicious. Fire races through a motel in downtown Prince George. Also, parents should plan accordingly that September we will see kids, certainly K to seven kids, uh, back in school. A hint from the education minister about BC's back to school plan and. He said he doesn't want to die alone. A daughter's desperate plea as permanent residency renewals pile up. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Three people are dead after an intense fire ripped through a motel this morning in downtown Prince George. As the CBC's Pamela McCall reports, investigators are calling it suspicious. Fire has gutted the Econo Lodge in downtown Prince George, right across from the CBC Bureau. We could see smoke billowing from the motel at around 9 this morning. A colleague ran outside and helped an elderly man with a cane who was screaming for his dog. There was major commotion. Firefighters arrived and managed to get everyone out, or at least they thought they did. Cody Walker was in his room and had to flee. I was uh, laying on my bed sleeping and then uh, I just seen all the smoke so I got up and I looked around. I threw all my stuff in the bag. I opened the front door and the flames came bursting at me so I fell on my back and I kicked the door shut. And I quickly grabbed the rest of my stuff, threw it off the balcony and then I just uh, jumped off the balcony. Prince George RCMP Corporal Craig Douglas says the fire is suspicious and they're investigating. The fire department is still on scene, still trying to put out the fire. It's still in the early stages of the investigation, but it is suspicious at this time, and therefore uh, our investigators are being asked to uh, work with the fire investigators on this. The mayor of Prince George, Lynn Hall, says this is devastating for the city of Prince George, the owners of the motel, and the people who are staying there who've now been relocated to other motels. It's just another one of those kicks that you don't need in a community. Uh, we've been very you know, diligent about uh, building our downtown and getting it uh, you know, to revitalization and lots of projects going on and then you have this happen, local ownership, and it is, it's devastating for us. Pamela McCall, CBC News, Prince George. On to the latest pandemic numbers now. There are 18 new cases of COVID-19 in BC, bringing the province's total to over 3,000 cases. Sadly, there's also been three more deaths, all three of them at the Holy Family Hospital in Vancouver. 186 people have now died from the virus in BC. There are still three long-term care and acute care outbreaks, and the number of active cases is the same at 162. 17 people are in hospital and three are in intensive care. Another 15 people have recovered since the last update. And tonight, an expanded warning for those who visited Number 5 Orange, the strip club on the downtown east side. Earlier, Health Minister Adrian Dix pointed to the role that clubs have had to play in the outbreak. Although he acknowledges the nightclub sector in general is doing a good job following the rules, he is open to making some changes, though. It would be certainly our preference not to take a sector-wide response, but it may be that both rules need to be changed and we need to ensure enforcement to make sure uh, that uh, the rules are followed and that people are kept safe. And more on that expanded number five orange advisory. People who visited on July 1st, 3rd, 4th and 7th now might have been exposed to COVID-19. They're asked to self-monitor for symptoms and self-isolate if they appear. Vancouver Coastal Health has closed the establishment to review its safety plan and reduce the risk to the public. Parents anxious for a clearer picture of what school is going to look like this fall will have to wait another few weeks. But we are getting a glimpse of what families should start preparing for now. Our Tanya Fletcher joins us live with more. So Tanya, why is the province taking so long to reveal its education plan for September? Well, Leanne, not only do we not have the back to school plan, we don't even have a solid date to find out that plan. And the education minister was pressed several times today by the opposition in question period and also today by reporters. It was pointed out that Ontario and Alberta, for example, have set August 4th as the day those provinces will reveal the full school restart plan. So why no solid dates here? Well, the government essentially doesn't want to promise too many specifics too early on in case the pandemic changes course.
We've seen a lot of governments promise uh, firm dates and have to quickly backtrack on those. Uh, Ontario comes to mind where they said schools were going to reopen at least four or five times and they never did and the, the same goes for Alberta. So look, we want to continue to have a science-based, science-informed uh, process. We can't just have one plan because we don't know what the trajectory of the uh, virus is going to be. So we have several plans that are being developed. And those plans we will learn uh, concrete details of. They're expected three weeks from now, he says. All right, Tanya, so what's the message to parents uh, hoping to make plans in the meantime? Yeah, well, parents are being told to plan, plan on a full restart for the upcoming school year. So a full restart is what to plan for. But remember, the province has said all along that the fall will likely involve still some kind of hybrid model. But he you know, mentioned today five days a week back in the classroom is the goal still at this point. Now, specifics are still being ironed out. Uh, but here's his advice for parents wondering if they need to start, say, making daycare arrangements right now you know if they have a k-7 to kid in particular is to, to plan a, a return to school uh, i'm very happy to see that uh, 85 percent of child care providers in the province of british columbia are now reopened so there's momentum there there will be more in the fall and as for what school will actually look like come september details around the health and safety protocols and the exact you know bell to bell schedules those will come through the districts and individual schools and parents whose kids are immunocompromised can contact them directly now to start making accommodations for a modified return in september leanne mike all right thank you tanya i'm sure you'll be watching for more updates you bet a sweeping review is being launched into BC's Police Act. The province announced a special all-party committee of MLAs that will look into modernizing and reforming policing. Specifically, it will examine systemic racism within police forces across the province. I think we're starting from the position that, uh, as we know, our institutions in this province have systemic racism uh, built into them, uh, often in the form of, of bias and often uh, unintentionally. And so it is the, uh, the, the, the role in this recommendation of the, of the terms of reference for the committee to examine that and bring back recommendations. The review will be done through the lens of UNDRIP to ensure policing aligns with BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The committee's final repute report is due next May. It'll include recommendations and will be made public. If you're a Canadian with a permanent resident card and it needs to be renewed, well, get ready for a long wait. What usually takes no more than a couple of weeks has turned into a nearly 10-month backlog. Government officials blame COVID-19 delays. As Bell Peary of CBC's Impact Team reports, one Vancouver couple is pleading with Ottawa to implement automatic extensions during the pandemic. It's a sudden urgent situation. At a time when travel is being discouraged, it's Kazuko Wakiyama's only option. Her 88-year-old father is in poor condition in a Japanese hospital. He is alone and he needs to be looked after. Compounding the situation, the senior lives in an area recently battered by downpours, flooding and landslides. Almost a million people have been forced to leave the area. But that's not what worries Wakiyama and her husband the most. We confirm at this time there's no permanent resident card application from us. The Vancouver chef applied in February to have her permanent resident card renewed, but nothing happened and it expired in May. She'll leave Canada not knowing for sure how she'll come home. We're not even in the system. Oh, what do you mean you're not in the system? Well, our, our application has been sent. We don't know if it's been received. We don't know where it is. That's due to a massive backlog of applications. Immigration Canada says due to COVID-19 related delays, PR renewals are backed up 287 days or nine and a half months. I, I have a, one solution that I, that I think is eminently doable and, and practical is why don't they just extend the deadline of the PR cards by a year? The agency didn't respond to CBC's request for comment before deadline. In urgent cases, PR travelers can apply for a special card. The temporary travel document is valid for one entry back into Canada. The problem is applications have to be submitted at visa centers once you're outside of the country. Doing it here before you go is not an option. Immigration lawyers have raised concerns about PR renewal delays. In response, Ottawa has implemented an electronic option to expedite the temporary cards. As much as IRCC says we're processing travel documents overseas and we're doing it electronically and we're doing it in a timely manner, 
things fall through the cracks. Wakayama isn't confident there won't be equally long waits for the one-time only cards. In the meantime, her father is weakening daily. He doesn't want to die alone. And uh, so he wants me to go home to see him the end. Wakayama is determined to travel before it's too late. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. West Vancouver police are investigating tonight after the department's pride crosswalk was defaced. It happened right outside the police station. Officers say just after four yesterday afternoon, they heard tires squealing and found someone had left tire marks right on the crosswalk at 16th and Esquimalt there. A suspect sped away and has not been found. The car is described as a black Ford Mustang with red racing stripes, a spoiler, and a hood scoop. Anyone with information is asked to contact West Van Police. A prominent B.C. Indigenous leader charged with sex crimes dating back to the 1970s has pleaded not guilty to all counts against him. Grand Chief Edward John did not appear in court today, his 71st birthday, but his lawyer entered the plea on John's behalf by phone. He is facing four counts of sexual intercourse with a female without consent. Prosecutors say the alleged offenses come from one woman over a seven-year period in 1974, seven-month period, rather, in the area of Prince George. John has not appeared in court in person since charges were laid eight months ago. His lawyer says John has elected to face trial by judge and jury. The charges he is facing existed in Canada's criminal code in 1974, but no longer exists under the current code. The mayor of Tofino and residents are shocked by a recent video that shows two men jumping jet skis through water crowded with surfers and swimmers. Have a look. A surf instructor who recorded it in mid-June says the pair was way too close to other people and could have sent someone to hospital or even worse. Mayor Josie Osborne says the municipality doesn't regulate the surf zone, but it can prohibit launching motorized vessels from the beach. Osborne says the video is sparking a conversation about what can be done to prevent and respond to similar situations. Well, COVID-19 closed the door on open houses, adding a new challenge to buying or selling a home. But today, the BC Real Estate Council released new rules allowing people to see properties in person. But as Zara Premji tells us, they come with the potential for added risk as well. Well, here we are. For 72-year-old Marie Shields, selling her house has meant she's had to sign up for some added risks. It's rather awkward and inconvenient in some ways. It's because no one knows what protocol to follow. It would be nice if there was some type of actual blanket regulation that the government offered. Hi, Marie. I'm here. But there is no mandated regulation, and with open houses back on the table, that list of risks is about to grow. In B.C., while property showings were able to continue going forward, open houses haven't been happening. There's two bathrooms upstairs. While open houses are now back, they're not going to be the traditional kind where you walk in as you please, explore in groups, and come and go whenever you want. This is not business as usual. You have to register for open houses. Uh, you uh, have to physically distance. You have to bring a mask. Um, there will be contact tracing. People will take your name. So for someone like Shields, who wants to sell her house, but has been in isolation for nearly four months, this does bring an added discomfort, even if it exposes her home to more potential buyers. Perhaps let's all be safe together and let's just wear a mask. It's sort of common sense in its own respect, isn't it? The Vancouver Tenants Union says this can also lead to more concerns for tenants who are already facing safety concerns during showings. Saying in a statement, as with other instances of renters' protections being removed, the continuation of these practices will contribute to putting tenants' lives and homes at risk for the sake of profit. We would urge the public and realtors to hold people uh, to these guidelines. This is the latest change in real estate for British Columbians, but Darlene Hyde says you can expect it to be one of the largest for the time being. She says nothing is risk free and you can expect to see a mask and gloves around when you go for an open house and probably until there's a vaccine found for COVID-19. Zara Premji, CBC News, Burnaby.
All right, let's bring in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff with the first check of the forecast. We always get an idea of what kind of a evening it is by looking at the skies behind you and your fantastic uh, view there. It is a gorgeous evening, Mike, uh, out behind me. You can see, I love I can do some uh, cloud identifying uh, on the spot, some uh, <laughs> alto uh, cirrus happening behind me. Those little patchy clouds often mean changes ahead. We've got some high cirrus and then off towards the North Shore, a few bubbling cumulus, my kind of evening. And temperatures are really quite nice, just hitting the uh, low 20s across Metro Vancouver. There is a system approaching. Those uh, alto cumulus are doing their job. In fact, it is raining across the island right now, filling in here in Metro Vancouver in the next few hours. Let me take you to the satellite and radar. Here's what those clouds look like from above. That cold front is moving across the island right now. So we're seeing those showers in Tofino, Nanaimo, Campbell River just making their way down to uh, Victoria in the next couple of uh, hours, I'd say. There it is, the leading edge of that front. Uh, heavier downpours in there as well. You can see that on the yellow in the radar. So we will see some substantial rain through the overnight. Again, really filling in probably past midnight for us, making for a wet start to your Thursday. It's not an all day event though. I see things clearing up by the afternoon, possibly some sunny breaks by the time we hit that 2 p.m. mark. Taking you down to a 14 tonight, back up to a 20, and I've got uh, lots more 20 degree temperatures where that came from. Uh, I've got the sunshine in towards the afternoon. Tomorrow could be the last of the rain for a few days. I've refocused on the weekend, and I think many people will be very pleased with the forecast I've got coming up. All right. Well, for now, we'll enjoy that uh, fair weather cumulus bubbling up uh, in behind you there. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you in a bit. Well, three orphan grizzly bear cubs from Alberta have a new home. The Greater Vancouver Sioux has taken them in, saying they would have been otherwise euthanized. The trio was orphaned when their mother was shot by hunters. The zoo says the triplets are adapting well to their new surroundings, while the zookeepers have been enjoying caring, caring for the curious trio. Grizzly bear cubs typically stay with their mothers for three years before heading out on their own, so these little ones will require some special care. The zoo says the public will be invited to name them in an online contest at a later date. Nice new home for them. Mm -hmm, cute. Well, a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And you can follow the both of us and Hannah on Instagram and Twitter as well. A hospital in Edmonton has closed its doors to new patients and cancelled all surgeries as an outbreak of COVID-19 continues to spread. Coming up, the other measure is being taken to try to contain the deadly virus. And thanks for watching our commercial free live stream online tonight. The COVID-19 pandemic has become the unlikely inspiration for a unique new endeavor by Prince Edward Island's poet laureate. Since March, she's shared a poem or story or song online daily for 100 days in a row. As CBC's Nancy Russell finds out, it has added new meaning to the author's role, connecting with people like never before. Julie Pellissier-Lush started setting up her phone and recording her daily posts on March 21st, inspired by a virtual powwow across the Maritimes and the number of views it received just as the pandemic began. And I realized at that point in time that there's such a need for uh, people to have some entertainment, something to take their mind off of the crazy stuff that's happening in the world, in our community, in our province. Even if it was just to hear the drumming, I thought it would be a great experience for the kids also. I wanted them to have something to look forward to every day. Give my eyes the teaching of truth so that I can see what is really there in front of me every day. The first month of posts were recorded at her home, but then as the weather improved, she headed outdoors and across the island. In May, there was a series of posts featuring nine new street signs, each with a Mi'kmaq name. I thought, I want to go to every one of them, learn how to pronounce them, say it, do a poetry reading at it, and show everybody where they are. Pellissier Lush says she has been excited to see the response to her posts. Oh my goodness, we get about three, 
thousand to seven thousand views on each of the different posts and lots of different comments that are encouraging and and make you realize that maybe this was what was needed for this time. Uh, Julie's been doing a wonderful job bringing both um, different places on the island, bringing islanders together, but also um, incorporating the Mi'kmaq culture into the poetry and bringing that love of poetry to um, people through a new medium. The pandemic series is now over after post 100, but Pellissier Lush hopes viewers will keep coming back. If somebody's interested, it'll still be there and it'll be sort of a legacy for, for what I've been trying to do as the Poet Laureate. And it is a place to tell stories. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Skamagan. COVID inspiration. Yeah, different, mm. looks good. Yeah. All right, uh, stay with us back in just a couple of seconds. A lot more news on COVID-19 from around the world and across the country in just a couple of seconds. Stick around. is marking some grim new milestones in the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, total new cases topping 3 million nationwide. Texas saw more than 10,000 new cases in one day for the first time, making it one of the many states experiencing an alarming resurgence of this disease. But as Salima Shivji tells us tonight, some White House officials are still focusing on the positives. As the virus keeps spreading across the country at a record pace, a slight hint of a plateau in the worst hit states, according to the vice president. We're actually seeing early indications uh, of a percent of positive testing flattening in Arizona and Florida and Texas. But that doesn't yet factor in the effects of this big crowds and few masks over the holiday weekend. And so with every member of the White House coronavirus task force in a mask, some were showing them off. Masks can be a fashion statement. She's urging Americans, especially in hot spots, to wear one too and stop gathering, especially in bars. Still, that message coupled with another contrasting one. It's time. Uh, it's time for us to get our kids back to school. It's not a matter of if schools should reopen. It's simply a matter of how. They must fully open and they must be fully operational. Following the president's lead, on Twitter, a threat to cut federal aid to schools that refuse to listen and a direct attack on his own government agency, the CDC, for what Donald Trump calls reopening guidelines that are too strict. And so there will be new guidelines and more clarity. And even with acknowledgement, some schools won't be able to fully reopen safely. Remember, it's guidance. It's not requirements. And its purpose is to facilitate the reopening and the keeping open the schools in this country. The focus on reopening full steam ahead, even as Trump welcomed Mexico's president to the White House. No traditional handshake, but neither one wearing a mask. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. And Alberta is experiencing another cluster outbreak of COVID-19. An Edmonton hospital announcing today it's now shutting its doors to new patients. Rafi Bouchikanian has more on what the hospital's calling a full facility outbreak. We all have to remain vigilant about COVID-19. Vigilance the Misericordia Hospital has only increased in the last few weeks. An outbreak has left three patients dead and at least 35 patients and staff infected. Now they're closing their doors to the public. It's meant cancelling the surgeries that were ongoing there, the outpatient appointments. We've moved labour and delivery and closed the emergency department. Some surgeries have moved to other hospitals and health officials are busy trying to figure out which staff need to get tested for COVID-19. Alberta's infection rates have been relatively low. Honourable member for Edmonton McClung has a question. 
so the opposition wants to know how an outbreak could shut down a hospital. To the minister, what emergency steps have you taken to prevent the spread of COVID-19? We uh, continue to work very closely with AHS and the medical officer of health for the Edmonton zone. I would certainly like to hear more about how this process occurred. The hospital says the outbreak started with two infected units, though it has not disclosed which ones, and it's still not clear how the virus got into the hospital, then spread. It, it could be a failure of PPE, it could be a, a failure of mask discipline. This epidemiologist says tracking that down is difficult in large healthcare facilities with multiple people going in and out and moving around. And with growing concerns about airborne transmission, there is something else to check, too. We need to take ventilation systems more seriously. The appropriate filters have to be put into place. The Misericordia says it's looking into its ventilation system. In the meantime, Alberta Health insists other hospitals can pick up the slack while it gets this outbreak under control. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. As fiscal snapshots go, it's not a pretty picture. Coming up, what the COVID-19 pandemic is doing to Canada's bottom line. From the outside, it hardly looks high-tech. Good right away, sir. But this cab company is home to some sophisticated computer and satellite technology. Will you be waiting out front, ma'am? For years now, some taxi companies have used data terminals like this one to keep in touch with drivers. What's leading edge about the system at Bel Air Taxi is that it's hooked into a web of satellites called GPS. GPS is the Global Positioning System, a network of 24 satellites set up by the U.S. military for navigation. It's now used by civilians like boaters and even hikers. A small receiver reads the satellite signals, figures out where the user is, and can even track the direction and speed they're going. The taxi system takes that one step further, transmitting to the main computer every few seconds exactly where the cab is. The dispatcher simply checks the screen to find out a cab's location and its status. For example, car 74 is purple when it's on its way to pick up a fare and turns light blue when the meter is turned on. It gives us the ability to uh, track the cars wherever they are. I'm told it's within approximately 100 feet of the actual vehicle location. Addresses can be typed into the computer and the dispatcher can give a lost driver directions. In an emergency, a red dot appears, and police know exactly where to go. Oh, there's a cheater. But the most practical application is finding cheaters, drivers who fib to the dispatchers about where they are. Way off. He's uh, around Metro Town. He's telling the computer he's just up the top of the hill here in Coquitlam. A classic example of cheating is when a driver drops a fare off at the airport and then tells the computer he's actually downtown. What he hopes is, by the time he gets here, he'll be at the top of the list. But sometimes the call comes while he's still 15 or 20 minutes away, leaving a customer fuming. But with GPS, a cheater can quickly be found out. And so, not surprisingly, drivers are a little ambivalent about this new system. We make more money by cheating, <laughs> as we make now. But customer got good service if we don't cheat. The company that developed the Bel Air taxi system predicts that within a few years, virtually every car will have something similar. So you might know as you're driving down on Highway 99 where your wife is, where your dad is, where your son is. I mean, you could see them on the map. And I mean, if they're close enough, you know, you may want to send them a message saying, hey, maybe we can have coffee together. I mean, that is not far-fetched. The main obstacle now is money. For big taxi companies, this system could cost tens of thousands of dollars. But manufacturers say one day GPS will be no more exotic or expensive than a car stereo. Ian Hannah Mansing, CBC News, Coquitlam, British Columbia. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. 
I see seen all the smoke, so I got up and I looked around. The girl threw all my stuff in a bag. I opened the front door and the flames came bursting at me, so I fell on my back and I kicked the door shut. And I quickly grabbed the rest of my stuff, threw it off the balcony, and then I just I jumped off the balcony. Many guests managed to escape when fire broke out at a motel in downtown Prince George this morning, but three people did not. It's not clear how the fire started, but investigators are calling it suspicious. There is an awful lot of planning going on with uh, every major stakeholder in the education system to have a, a safe full restart to the school system. And I think parents should plan accordingly that September we will see kids, certainly K to seven kids, uh, back in school. That's BC's education minister hinting today about the possible return to school plan for students in the fall. But he says don't expect anything to be formally announced for several weeks. He wants me to go home to see him the end. Uh, I just wanted uh, to be able to do his wish. A Vancouver woman is desperate to visit her sick father in Japan, but she's worried she won't be able to come back to Canada. Kazuko Wakayama is a permanent resident whose card has expired. Immigration Canada says due to COVID-19 delays, there's a 10-month backlog of PR renewals. Wakayama is pleading for automatic extensions during the pandemic. Well, Finance Minister Bill Morneau delivered his fiscal snapshot of the cost of the COVID-19 crisis today, and it is not a pretty picture. Canada's projected deficit now exceeds $340 billion. As the CBC's David Cochran reports, that kind of spending hasn't been seen since World War II. In the long history of Canada, no finance minister has ever given a fiscal update quite like this, because there has never been a time quite like this. At a time when Canada's Canadian workers and families are facing significant hardship, austerity and tightening your belt is not the answer. The cost of COVID has been enormous. The projected deficit now $343 billion, the biggest since the Second World War. The debt now projected to hit a record high of $1.2 trillion. The economic toll, the worst since the Great Depression, with the economy expected to shrink by 6.8%. The job numbers staggering. Five and a half million Canadians have lost their jobs or most of their hours. That's one third of the entire workforce. Some will criticize us on the cost of action, but our government knew that the cost of inaction would have been far greater. But the cost has still been great. Even after all that spending and tentative steps towards reopening, thousands of businesses are still closed. Millions of Canadians can't work. So the one new measure in this snapshot, about $50 billion for future changes to the wage subsidy, which will be tweaked and extended to allow more businesses to reopen and rehire. The Prime Minister has absolutely no plan to help Canadians return to work. No plan to guide our economic recovery. No plan to stimulate growth, attract business investment, or to create the conditions for job growth. As bad as these numbers are, there is a real chance they could get even worse. If there is a second wave, another surge in COVID cases that would trigger another lockdown and require even more federal aid. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the fiscal snapshot in Ottawa is one of the reasons Justin Trudeau declined an invitation to go to Washington today. The presidents of Mexico and the U.S. are holding an event at the White House celebrating the trade deal that replaced NAFTA. They will have a separate uh, day with Canada. They're coming down at the appropriate time. Donald Trump and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador signed a joint declaration on friendship and cooperation and held talks on the new trade deal. It went into effect in all three nations on July 1st. Despite Trump's verbal and Twitter attacks on Mexican immigrants and Mexico, he says he has a warm relationship with Obrador. Trump says he'll be speaking with Trudeau today by phone. A new report by our country's Auditor General has discovered a major failure from Canada's Border Services Agency. As Catherine Cullen explains, tens of thousands of deportations might not have taken place. There has been so much scrutiny of some of the people arriving in Canada. This report raises questions about how and whether some leave. 
The Auditor General found that as of April 2019, there were 50,000 individuals with so-called enforceable removal orders, where a person from another country no longer has the legal right to stay in Canada. In many cases, these are failed asylum claimants. The report revealed that for the majority, 34,700 cases in the wanted inventory, individuals' whereabouts were unknown. In the case of criminal cases, these are the highest priority for removal, yet we found that many remained uh, in the agency's inventory for years. Well, the findings overall are pretty damning. This isn't simply a bureaucratic issue, but one of national security, says this professor. If you can't enforce these removal orders, then you're allowing dangerous individuals, whether they're criminals, war criminals, others, to remain in Canada and often remain in Canada in ways that you don't even know where they are. Still, the numbers may not tell the whole story. People may have left without the border agency's knowledge, says this lawyer. We've also had cases where CBSA will call us to, to discuss um, a client's case and we let them know that the client, as a matter of fact, left months ago. The Prime Minister today pledged to do a better job of ensuring the integrity of the immigration system. We will uh, be looking very closely and following the recommendations made by the Auditor General. So no plan, specifically? The Canada Border Services Agency says it's reviewing all of its outstanding cases and focusing on those of greatest concern. But Wark says in order for the agency to get its act together, a more in-depth, regular review is needed. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. While our weather here in Metro Vancouver this summer is, uh, well, it's been a bit on the chilly side, but back east it's hot, smoking hot. The complications of staying cool in a pandemic coming up. And 25 to 7, there's a live look at, I think we're looking out towards the beach in Tofino there. Pretty misty of a day. Managed to stay dry, though, for the most part on the south coast. An old and familiar friend, though, is returning tonight. That's the rain. Also, Johanna, she'll be back after the break. Hi, I'm Vern, and uh, this is my home. This house is extremely unique. Built in 1928, it was built by Harry Lowe, who was an infamous rum runner who hung out with the likes of Al Capone. It's a monster of an attitude sort of house. Like, if you look at the outside, you have turrets, and you have peaks, and you have copper, and there's just a combination of arches, and it's just stunning. But it's not one type of house. Right when I bought the house in 2012, it was just one of those houses that I had driven by, I had driven by, and I always thought I would get arrested because I would park out front here, and I felt like I was the house stalker before I owned it. This is the foyer entrance. So everything in here is done in a walnut, and that was sort of typical back in the 20s. The stairs were built literally right here. But this was done with just a couple of Geppettos. I mean, you know, they got a couple of saws and a chisel, and they create this sort of thing. Every molding is curved. Like, it's just like insane. It looks flipping cool. I do live here by myself. I don't consider myself uh, the king of any castle, but this is my castle, so we can, we can go with that. So I'm in the manufacturing industry, and we manufacture anything that deals with wood. The whole house needed woodwork. It was a perfect match. Took about two years to restore it, and uh, it was a fabulous experience. This is ceiling detail here. About 25% of it was destroyed, and we recreated parts so that we could restore it. The panel work in here is all original panel work, the doors and the trim. The table itself was manufactured by my company. So this fireplace here, when I bought the house, it had probably nine coats of paint on it, but now this is basically what it would have looked like back in Harry Lowe's time. The ceiling, it's all plaster, it's all custom, and each rosette is very similar, but they're not the same. And there's thousands of them. It makes you wonder how it was even done. Today, it would be generated on computer, and it would be no problem. It's a lot of house for one guy, but yeah, I, I live in a very small portion of this house. This is the master bedroom. There's some leaded glass windows in the attic that I really wanted to see them in the bedroom. So what we did is we cut out the attic, created this upside down ship sort of effect, put in a cool chandelier. Because I do live here, I wanted to have some modern technology. So I built in the bed with a TV. So this is really my little sanctuary. This is a dream home. 
This is a home that I've wanted for probably 18 to 20 years, and you can't help but love this house. Well, Toronto was hit by a brutal thunderstorm today, and we'll tell you about that in just a moment. What came before it was a relentless heat wave. As CBC's Thomas Dagla tells us, the pandemic is just making it all more complicated. Getting tested for COVID-19 may be uncomfortable, but waiting in the heat can be unbearable. Or how about the unavoidable sweat that comes with wearing that mask in the sun? such as the trouble enduring an especially hot start to summer amid the pandemic. It's almost like desert kind of conditions, very, very hot, uh, morning, noon and night. It's, it's relentless. It's really a marker of, hey, what we might see more as the norm. This heat wave came earlier than usual, blasting parts of central Canada with temperatures above 30 for seven days straight, more than some cities normally see all summer. I was really surprised that it's uh, been this hot for so long. It's hot because you, you want to get out of the house, but then you're afraid to leave the house. A pandemic means fewer places to cool off, from this indoor water park in Windsor, shuttered by the virus, to all those air-conditioned movie theaters still unable to show movies. Some have no choice but to turn to emergency cooling centers, like Brian Riccardi, homeless for three months, and staying at this center now for five nights. The floors are really cold and there are no blankets, but it's better than staying on the streets. Those already put at risk by the virus are made all the more vulnerable now. Consider most rooms in long-term care homes in Ontario and Quebec have no air conditioning. I'm not worried about an outbreak of COVID-19, a wave of COVID-19 over the summer. Now what I'm worried about is a new wave of deaths that will occur over the summer, basically because of heat-induced illness. Toronto may have seen afternoon thunderstorms and flooding, but remember, the hottest days of the year are usually still two weeks away. Thomas Dagg, the CBC News, Toronto. And Johanna Wagstaff joins us again with the forecast. So, Joe, you've been tracking some of that wild weather back east, some of that flooding we just saw, hey? That's right. It, in fact, it's that very hot and sticky air that was the fuel for very severe thunderstorms. The trigger was breezes off the uh, lakes that kind of converged and sparked up those thunderstorms. I want to show you pictures uh, of the flooding in downtown Toronto, uh, really in the west end of the city. Things picked up around 3 p.m. local time when a very isolated but intense thunderstorm cell drifted from north to south across the city, seeing 50 to 70 millimeters of rain in under 40 millimeter uh, in under 40 minutes. I should say, for the west end of the city. Uh, you can see submerged and floating cars. Officials asking people to stay away from uh, flooded sections of the streets tonight. Uh, also getting some tree damage and uh, a few thousand without power at the peak of that storm. A lot of Torontonians uh, talking about uh, that very severe and very rapid storm. And uh, at the same time, the, uh, the Environment Canada actually issued a tornado watch for the region. It was downgraded to, to a tornado warning, uh, sorry, a thunderstorm warning, but uh, a very active Wednesday afternoon for the city of Toronto. Back here in Vancouver, we've got a very different kind of weather system approaching. I'm not expecting any thunderstorms, but we do have that rain coming. There's a quick look at that Toronto cell, though, sliding down uh, from the north. Still under that ridge of high pressure for the east and still under the low pressure technically for the west. As I take you through the forecast, though, things are changing. We're looking for that low pressure system to start to shift 
shift eastward. That's what's pushing in the cold front. I can already see the bands way off in the distance crossing from the strait. So rain to fill in overnight into your Thursday. Look at that second band of rain, though, for Friday. It sort of lifts up into central and northern coastal sections as a little bit of a high pressure builds in through the southern half of the province. And I think that's what will protect us this weekend. Uh, temperatures right now just hitting the 20 degree mark for most of Metro Vancouver and out to the valley as well. And the interior getting into the uh, mid 20s. Taking a look at your five day forecast, the one we all want to see as we head into the weekend. Clearing Thursday, as I mentioned, a good looking Friday on tap with highs to a seasonal 22 and then check that out Saturday and Sunday mix of sun and cloud. I do think there is still a slight chance of a stray shower. We'll get confirmation on those models over the next couple of days, but definitely trending towards a drier weekend. And it looks like that little ridge of high pressure will linger through next week as well. So I'm going to I'm going to say right now, I think we're going to start to see some summer like weather uh, for the south coast uh, starting Friday. Well, it's about time. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Well, the youth charity WE is coming under more scrutiny tonight. The inner workings of the organization have been attracting attention ever since it was awarded a multi-million dollar federal contract. That agreement was cancelled last week. But now a former WE employer who is black, employee rather, who is black, is speaking out. CBC's Farah Malarali has this exclusive story. Are you ready to change this world? We Charity is well known for youth empowerment and close ties to influential people. But now this former employee paints a different picture. I felt like I was sinking in sand. Amanda Maitland was asked to speak on a 2019 We Anti-Racism tour in Alberta. She says she wrote her own speech and started the tour. But on a brief return to Toronto, she says she was called into a meeting. I was literally put a new speech on the table and told that there, there had to be changes. It was completely watered down. Um, it wanted me to talk about cornrows and it wanted me to talk about the Oscars and the language was just completely different. The changes, she says, came from a team of nearly all white WE employees. CBC News spoke to 15 former WE employees. Several confirmed they knew Maitland's speech was changed. Most described what they called, quote, culture of fear within the organization. Rhea Carey says she experienced that fear. Never in my life before had I felt like unsure about my opinion, my values and where I stand because of how they made it seem like I was negative. So first of and foremost, one Maitland's story, which she first shared on Instagram, has now sparked a flurry of other testimonials. I'm speaking out about it because I'm, I've left the organization. I too need to speak up about my experiences that we. I am disgusted and Enraged. After CBC News reached out to the charity, we co-founders Craig and Mark Kielberger apologized publicly to Maitland, saying, you shared in your video that the words of your speech were altered. It simply should not have happened. In a separate statement about an alleged culture of fear, we told CBC, we members can anonymously submit on a feedback portal any concerns or issues they have. I need to know that it's coming from a genuine place. That apology was also sent to Maitland personally. But for now, she says she's taking time to reflect on the words. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Montreal have their first ever rule book on when it's appropriate to stop someone for a police check. Until now, there was no policy. The new guide was prompted by a report that found visible minorities are four to five times more likely to be stopped than white people. But as Jayla Bernstein reports, critics say the new policy misses the mark. Montreal police praise themselves for creating Quebec's first ever street check policy, though it comes years later than the application of similar policies in Vancouver and Toronto. Et pour moi, la discrimination... For me, discrimination has never belonged, the police chief says. To put that value into practice, this new policy outlines when officers are allowed to stop someone for the purposes of identifying them or collecting information. Street checks must be based on observable facts and motivated by one of these reasons. Helping someone in need, preventing incivility such as a noise complaint warning, preventing a crime, collecting information or identifying a missing or wanted person. But some say that wide-ranging list still leaves the door open for abuse. For example, intercepting people within the context of fighting incivilities, 
we always recognize that incivility is basically as a catchword in the policy to allow for police intervention against people of minorities and low-income neighborhood. This Montrealer says he's been stopped as many as five times in one month while driving for nothing. But the new policy fails to address traffic stops, leaving that to the highway safety code. It just affects everything that you do. Like, it affects how I'm going to drive with my, with my moonroof closed because I know there's going to be more light in the car and they're going to be more likely to look inside, inside, in, in, inside the car to, to judge or to, 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 to apply the judgment and then being stopped. Every time I cross a cop, I'm like, oh, well, he's going to do your U-turn. The phenomenon of driving while black. That is the number one complaint we have of people that feel that they've been discriminated against by uh, police officers in that situation. Because the police officer has the right under the highway code to be able to ask for ID without a justification, well, that ex simply excludes them from this policy. Police say there is room for their policy to evolve. They're working with this sociologist. He'll be offering critical, independent feedback. I believe in police's willingness, he says, and for me, it's important to be here rather than be absent and to be able to tell them when they're out in left field and to force them to do better. The new policy comes into effect this fall. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Canada is banning puppy imports from Ukraine. The move follows a tragic incident in Toronto last month that saw several dogs die in transit. As David Common reports, animal rights activists say the ban doesn't go nearly far enough. More than 500 puppies were crammed into the cargo hold of a flight landing in Toronto just three weeks ago. Nearly a day after those dogs were crammed into dozens of crates in Ukraine, believed to be the work of puppy mills selling to Canadians seeking a dog fast. 38 of the puppies died in transit. At least one purportedly left in this bag. Ukraine International Airlines now tells CBC News it will temporarily suspend the transportation of animals on long-haul flights. And the Canadian Food Inspection Agency targeted the lucrative puppy trade in Canada by stopping the importation of commercial puppies under eight months of age from Ukraine. It's going to be harder for them, but this is only temporary, so I'd like to see where Canada plans to make the changes permanent and not just to the Ukraine, um, to the other countries that are in consideration and behind this as well. Indeed, the federal action is not permanent, only targets commercial importation, and it still permits any number of puppies, even from puppy mills in other Eastern European countries. It's a big business. Just look at Toronto's Kijiji listings, puppies for two and three thousand dollars. We need to overall ban the commercial importation of dogs for sale into Canada. We already have our own thriving puppy mill industry, sadly, here in Canada. And we don't need to add by actually bringing more animals in from other countries that are coming from puppy mills. But that's not what the feds have done, targeting only the most recent and disastrous import. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Well, they are a symbol of Canada, majestic for certain, but also, well, a little grouchy as far as birds go. And they're everywhere here in Metro Vancouver. So why are there so many, and why do they stay here year-round? We have a lot of questions. We'll take a gander next.
Okay, uh, take a stroll around most parks in Metro Vancouver. You'll see a lot of things, including geese. A lot of them, and with those geese, of course, comes, well, you know. You know. You know. You know. <laughs> I believe poop is the word. So why are there so many geese in Metro Vancouver? We spoke to a biodiversity planner to find out. They're hard to miss around Metro Vancouver. Canada geese, gaggles of them, crowding parks, beaches, the seawall, and even the streets. So why are these iconic birds always flocking around our public spaces? <laughs> Urban biodiversity planner Jennifer Ray Pierce says goose populations were actually reintroduced to Metro Vancouver in the 1970s for hunting and consumption. However, unlike their native cousins, these geese don't migrate, and they like our parks and beaches just as much as we do. The main reason is that geese enjoy a lot of the same habitat features that people do. So nice uh, low cut lawns, sloping, uh, gently sloping areas with little ponds are just perfect for geese. There are no exact numbers on the number of geese that live here year round, but Pierce estimates the number could be higher than 2,600. And that amount of geese feeding and living in the city leads to a lot of poop. So Canada geese do produce more poop in volume for the amount of food that they eat than most species do. It's just because their digestive system is not very efficient. And what about all that waste getting into our water? Pierce says not to worry about it. People are always concerned about the impacts of goose species on water quality, and particularly as E. coli numbers are sometimes reported as being at unsafe levels. Um, but actually what's been found is that even in areas where geese are physically relocated, the E. coli numbers don't change in any me real measurable way. So the thinking is that the E. coli source is not primarily geese, but something else. So what is the city doing to keep them under control? So the primary management technique that's used right now in Vancouver is called egg addling. And that's where shortly after the eggs are laid, they're sterilized. The other techniques that work really well is changing the landscape so that it's not as desirable of a place for geese by introducing more shrubbery um, or even temporary fencing around water bodies can help in particular high traffic areas. Some BC cities are also looking at allowing goose hunting permits to tame the population. Because if you didn't know before, the Canada goose is, in fact, edible. Well, with, with a nice wild mushroom reduction, perhaps. I'm telling you, braised goose, goose feet, Chinese delicacy, <laughs> with some nice, like, shiitake and okay. Japanese oh, bok choy, sure. a deep Well, it sounds like you're going to be lining up for a permit or something there soon. No good with the gun. They're nasty on the golf course, too. <laughs> They're really nasty on the golf course if you go you know, tread into their... I think I just prefer a little gray goose, Leanne. Oh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, you know what? That one would be ideal. There you, go. you can uh, always watch this newscast uh, and latest geese information at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news right here at 11 o'clock. I'll be here after the national, and we're going to leave you tonight with a distant performance of All You Need Is Love by the VSO, Dan Mangan, and frontline health workers. This was a thank you for all that's being done to continue bending BC's COVID-19 curve. Have a good night. Nothing you can do.